Welcome to Tech Tuesday, everybody. Hello. So much clapping, so little Hello. noise. Welcome to the world of Zoom. Alexa, air horn. A little anticlimactic, but thank you, Joe. I love that. Siri would have said, what What did you say? Hey, Siri. Air horn. I'm listening. <laughs> you just turned on Siri on my phone. <laughs> oh hey, Siri. Hey, gosh. Google. Alexa. Air horn. Siri's useless. Okay. I found this on the web for Alexa Air Horn. Check it out. It's great. And then... You know, and scene. This has been a inside look office on a normal Tuesday. You're all welcome. I'm so sorry for blowing up your series and Alexis, etc. Okay, uh, let's get started. Tradition. Let's dive right in. To keep blowing up, or everyone's talking. Keep the wires. I got the wires. Keep blowing up while everyone's talking. What are the odds that Boom. Wisnet has the manual up? There Quick, send him. <laughs> yeah, what if we did a twist where we didn't have the manual in front of us and we just had to, like, guess? <laughs> uh, <laughs> that would, uh, yeah. Kind of like we do every weekend. Quick game. Okay, everybody hear, everybody hear the music? Yeah, I've got okay. I've got Simon Says and I've got the, uh, the old oh, secret, secret. who's on first. I got symbols. Right on, right on. Okay. Wires keypad whatever it's called let's see what shall we do today let's do i feel like we've done all these what the heck i feel like we need to do something that's actually difficult the multitasker famous last words bayshore well always makes me want to play we the knob we didn't do this one okay we'll start with this one it's called the knob I don't know what this means, but this is the uh, includes a needy module, so I'm gonna need some help for on that on that section. Five minutes, six modules, one strike, and just somebody be ready to look up needy modules, please. Thank you. They just need go. to be managed. There's not really a uh, <clears throat> you just have to do whatever it says. So if like some of them, some of them have instructions though, like specific things. Oh yeah, you're right. Let me just keep scrolling here. Yeah, I know I'm right. All right, here we go. Calm down, calm down, Matt. Okay. Okay. Twelve oh two. Oh, that's the time. Um, okay, we got two sets of symbols, some wires. The uh, who's on first? A needy, mo a needy module, and then oh, frick, this wires one. It's the th it's the set of three wires. It has one, two, three, A, B, C on each side. I got both. I'm ready for symbols. Right, for who's on first, let me know that word. The word is C, S-E-E. -E. Okay, um, let's start with symbols. Uh, wires. Nate, I got, okay, yep. Joe, wires. You, I've got the normal set of wires is three wires, and it's blue, red, blue. Okay, what about the other thing? Uh, the other thing is you have that module. Yeah, it's like one, two, three, ABC. What, what, yeah, what, yeah. What's connected? Uh, let's come back to that. Let me give Nate symbols first. Because that one will take a bit. Uh, Nate, symbols Chris, are the back. What are you the doing? Back, <laughs> the backwards in. Uh, Nate, are you listening? Okay. Backwards yes, in yeah, yeah, yeah. with the thing over over it. The flat six. The six that looked like it got squished. The AE. Yep. Uh, and then the trident thing. That's the first set. All right. Do six. Yep. Right word. AE, uh, trident, uh, and. Okay, next set is the upside down P with the T crossbar, the alien three, okay. the backwards paragraph, and a little smiley face. Uh, do the smiley face. Yep. The T with the B. Yep. The backwards thingy, and then the three with the squiggly. Okay, got it. Um, Bentley, can word. you give me the order of the lights on the knob? Uh, oh, shoot, yes. Uh, I need, so, uh, so top row, left to right, and then bottom row, left to right. Okay. Off, 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 on, off. On, off, off, on, on, on. 17 Andy, seconds. Andy, cut the bottom blue wire when you get there. Send me that bottom right word. Justin, quickly. 
Five seconds. Uh, it's very difficult. Can you? I need to repeat. Which ones are lit? Shoot. Uh, we did. Yeah. Oh, we did. Oh uh, well, that was that was a bummer. That was exciting. Uh, all right. Well, I guess so. That was <laughs> that was a neat. That was a needy module you had there. Uh, yeah, that was a needy module. The so those have their, their own. Those yeah. Have their own timers. Yeah. Yeah. We should have done that one first. Yeah. Because that right. has a separate timer from the other one. Yeah. Okay. Uh. Well, can't win them all. This is a loss. We're done with this. Not like you were setting dip switches on a DMX. Like. That was like setting dip switches. That would be a good segue if that's what we we're talking about today. But it's not. So, um, what we are talking about today, though is embedding and disembedding. Super exciting, I know. Um, this is uh, kind of the last continuation of what we've been talking about the last few weeks with video signal flow. And with that, I am going to pass it over to our very own Joseph Lack, who is gonna kind of set up the topic and give us some of the basics. Hello, hello. Well, over to you, Joe. Well, thank you, Andrew. You're welcome. Well, well thrown. So, ah, yeah, this is a fun topic uh, because it's important and it has a lot of a lot of very pertinent applications to what we do specifically. And I know a lot of people in the industry need to rely on this. Uh, it's also something that can get confusing fast and messed up quickly. So having clarity about it's really helpful. And a special edition of of presentation support for Tech Tuesday. We're going light mode otherwise known as what things existed before dark mode. Um, but yeah, episode six, embedding and disembedding. So let's introduce a problem. Problem is I have two sources that need to reach the same destination at the same time. Now you can run two individual lines from those things and run them all through your building. But then what happens if, if one line of signal is longer than the other and you're running into some issues of sync and things like that. So really what you need to do is get something together so that it can reach your source at the same time and be in good shape. So that's where we come into embedding. And this is a idea of combining two sources into one signal, which then makes it easier to route. So here's a little visual idea of what this looks like. You have your audio signal, your video signal, your embedder, and then the destination. And what happens is your audio and video signal are sending, the embedder combines them and then sends them off to the destination through one cable which makes things a lot nicer. You have fewer components in the equation once you get past the embedder, and it just gives you the ability to get everything you need in a single route to your destination. But then, if what if you want to do the opposite, which is another problem of I have one source that needs to reach different destinations and they aren't connected to one another. Maybe your video signal is your projector and your screen up at the stage and your audio destination is your sound console or part of your IO rack in the a back room or something like that. So this is where disembedding becomes very helpful. And disembedding is separating one source into two signals, ultimately giving you control. So what that looks like is you've got your source, you've got your disembedder, and then your two different destinations. And essentially what's happening is you route your source to your disembedder, which then separates those two signals and sends them to their destinations for you. So it gives you the flexibility that you need, again, instead of in both of these situations, instead of running, a whole bunch of cable all through the building and everything like that, you can get these things embedded or dis together or disembedded to just allow you a lot more flexibility. So let's take a look at uh, some examples. So this is a, a device that we used for a long time, the AJA HD 10 AMA. Uh, it's a four channel embedder disembedder. It can actually do both, um, not at the same time, but you pick one or the other, whatever you're doing. They This model actually is a little older. They've upgraded it since to now be the 3G AMA, which essentially it's doing the same thing. There's one less SDI out uh, port and there's some additional uh, tools that the device has, but essentially it's, it's just a newer version doing the same thing. And so essentially what you're doing is you have your, um, in a disembedding situation, you have your video signal in, and then your audio is broken out into an analog output through an XLR fan out, which I'll show you in a minute. And then you also have this loop out feature. Now in a disembedding situation, what you can do is have the video signal with audio come in and then you can loop that out intact with the, everything still together if you wanted to loop that to another destination. Or an example of how we used to use this was, so we send eight channels of audio from our broadcast campus to other locations. 
And for a while, the AJA devices were really the best ones that we could find to disembed audio in a, a clean way for us in a consistent, reliable way. However, sending eight, but all this only being able to do four, we actually would put two together. You'd have the signal come in, loop out to the second device, and then these, um, these embedders, disembedders have a dip switch panel on the other side from what you see in the picture that allows you to choose essentially how you're disembedding or embedding and what channels of audio and things like that. So what we would do is we'd set the first device to disembed channels one through four, send that out the fan out, and then the second device would be set to di uh, disembed five through eight. And so that's how we would get our eight channels into our IO rack and be able to process the audio. And this is how we would send our broadcasted uplink signal on a week to week basis. Now, uh, when you're embedding, what you're doing is you're just reversing that audio flow and now you're sending audio into this device. You still have your video signal coming in and now what's happening out that SDI out is the embedded signal of your video with your new audio source. Now, what if you have any audio present on that input, it'll actually be removed first and then embedded with the new audio. It's not an additive thing, it's, it replaces it completely. So one way that things have gotten into trouble, and as I was learning this, I remember being kind of confused and getting stuck sometimes, is as I would almost use this as a loop out, and, and it was set to embed, and I would try to send something through it, and I wasn't getting any audio on that new place because I wasn't sending any audio in. I thought the stuff that I was inputting would go with it. Just got a little confusing. So. Just know and remembering that when you're disembedding, it does loop out. When you're embedding, it doesn't with the audio because it's inputting the new audio first. Um, I want to show you that fan out of what that looks like. That's what this guy is. Is on the side. I've got one here because they're fun to play with. Um, they're also nice and long and, and just lots of different things going on. So hopefully you're, you're already seeing maybe some of the limitations or drawbacks to this system. And so this, this you have the DB connector, DB25 connector on the left, and then you've got your four male and four female XLR connectors for either embedding or disembedding. Now, if you could only do one at a time, you can see that you were gonna have quite a bit of excess cable. You've got your four that you need, and then this other stuff here. And, and then in our situation, what I described with our broadcasted signals, when we had two of these things, now we had eight free ends and a bunch of cable that just had to be wrapped up and tucked in, shoved into a corner. So while at the time the, uh, the AJA units were great because of quality and that's what was the best available to us, they did have their limitations with all the excess cable. So as we've, as we've moved on and, and grown to, to find other products that we like, there's a new, newer uh, disembedder and in a better company that we like, which is Cobalt. And so the advantage no to this, sponsor. no sponsor. Yeah. Give us a, shirt. maybe one day. <laughs> yeah. Lucid chart. Um, so what this guy does is this actually has the ability to disembed all eight channels for us in a DB 25 to XLR fan out. Um, they do make an, an embedder version. Now the, the, the drawback is this only does one thing. It does disembedding or it does embedding. And you, if you want to have both available, you need to have two different devices. Um, and two different fan outs because of the XLR direction. But, it's, but it is nice to have just one device, you're eliminating points of failure with multiple units and power supplies and all this extra cable and everything like that. So definitely pros and cons to the AJA units and these Cobalt units. Um, it it kind of depends on your situation, what you need to have happen. So if you are only embedding or disembedding four channels at max, the AJA one might actually be a good choice for you because it can do both both directions and if you're in a situation where something's a little more temporary and you need the flexibility to be like embedding at some point and disembedding at another point actually might be kind of a helpful product but for us these eight channel ones are really helpful because of of that of eight channels being our broadcast uh jeremy on the chat was asking about price difference do we want to talk about pri price on here none of these guys are sponsors yet so i don't think we want to start talking about prices you can go on to like bnh or marker tech uh, they're not they're not terribly far off from one another, honestly. Um, but I don't want, I don't want to misquote anybody price wise. But um, they're both under a thousand dollars. So, and you do need to get the fan out separately. So, but jump on a market tech, jump on to B and H or something. You can find out price points, things like that. By the way, Cobalt and AJA, uh, if you guys are listening, uh, we would love a sponsorship. I'm sure we could work that out. Yep. Uh, if you want to hook us up. I'll wear a Cobalt Tuesday. 
re- review some products. Yeah, Co- uh, Cobalt Only Tech Tuesday. Uh, we'd be happy to uh, to talk about that. Anyway, carry on. There we go. So here's a here's a DB25 to XLR fan out for the Cobalt device. You can see all eight XLR ends are the same direction. So I've got one of them here, a new brand, a brand new one. This is the um, embedding one that has all the female ends. Um, but again, it's it's they make these a different lengths. You can get them from Sweetwater or different places, you know, three feet, five feet, 10 feet, um, you know, whatever, whatever application is, is needing and everything like that. So we're still at a point going through this in our context where this isn't exactly the most efficient thing yet because we embed and we disembed simultaneously every single weekend, multiple times. So we need, we need a, several of these mini converters and these devices in place all the time. We're not swapping them back and forth and flipping dip switches on a weekly basis. We really need something more reliable um, and something that can kind of do more than just one particular thing or even just a couple things. So that's where we jump into, um, actually, nope, I got ahead of myself. Here's another option, a Blackmagic SDI to HDMI converter. <laughs> not a great so, setup for Blackmagic. I know, exactly. <laughs> that can do everything. Oh wait, it's just Blackmagic. Um, we love Black yeah. Magic. Real quick, I'd probably, take, I'd probably take a sponsorship from them too. Depends on what it was. I'll wear I'll wear a Black Magic shirt. Um, so I got ahead of myself. But yes, if you this is a less expensive option if you just need a couple channels from front of house, like a front of house feed for an overflow setup or something. These these mini converters will do will disembed channels one and two off the SDI feed out the quarter inch ports, and and you can you know kind of do a front of house mix out that. Embedded on that line, send your HDMI to your monitor and then quarter inch out to some powered speakers if you just need a temporary kind of pop up set for um, for your overflow or something like that. So inexpensive option, but remember that, you know, typically quality and cost match each other. Quality up, cost up, quality down, cost down. Um, where I was going with lots of flexibility and lots of helpfulness is the AJA FS4. This is one of our favorite tools. Um, that we have, have really been integrating into new campuses over the last couple of years and then updating old campuses because there's a ton of functionality here, which Justin Wisnett, our, our integrator and great stash representative, is going to talk a little bit about. I think uh, Kimry would disagree with you on the stash thing, but uh, thank you, Joe, for that setup. That was great. Um, so, yeah, uh, FS4, this is what we've uh, started going to um, as we try to roll out uh, getting SD9, Digico SD9 uh, audio consoles, because uh, they have MADI ports on the back of it. Um, and it's the right amount of console for what we're trying to accomplish uh, weekend and week out. So um, so yeah, so to start with this, um, it does have fan out on the left-hand side. If you are looking, it's on the left-hand side. It's AES audio is the fan out there. Um, which we really don't use that much of because it has MADI ports. So um, if Joe wants to zoom in on that, uh, the two, so if you see here, there's a box that has MADI in and out, and then there is also uh, SDI, and you see that there are eight SDI ports, which is for in and out. Um, so the, the good thing about this uh, device is it is very flexible to be able to change from embed to disembed. So you could do, the way we use it is two embedders and then two disembedders. The first two embedders are uh, channels one and two, and then two uh, disembedders are three and four. Uh, You could do it three embedders and one disembedder or three disembedders, one, it it doesn't matter. You can do all four of them as embedders if you wanted to, or all four as disembedders. Um, So that's the reason why we like this product now. Um, It's you know, we, we really only used it at our permanent facilities um, for the most part, but now we've started to, uh, as we're growing and as we're trying to uh, get a little bit better systems, we have started switching over to FS4s at um, uh, non-permanents. So any non-permanents that are watching right now, it may come in the future. We're just trying to figure that out, but obviously it's a money thing because uh, we'd have to update your console and uh, also, you know, update your fly pack. Um, so the, the good thing here is, um, each, uh, SDI input or output can either send or receive, uh, 16, uh, 16 inputs or, uh, audio inputs or outputs. Um, so it just depends on how you have it set up. The way we have it set up is again, 
uh, first two are embedders. So one through 32 um, in the software is uh, all of our audio that is being embedded in and then uh, disembed. So three and four for us is living as one, uh, your living as one would uh, live on three and your T2 would live on four. Um, and so even though the T2 and living as one is not using 16 channels of audio, it is there in case we ever wanted to move to that in the future. Um, but again, we're only doing eight channels from living as one and we're doing four channels from the T2. Um, and then if you look up to the front view of the FS4, you'll see vi uh, vid one, vid two, vid three, vid four. Those are just uh, really quick key selectors for seeing your video output on the screen on the left-hand side. So this, uh, this device obviously is using, it says 4K, 2160p, 5994. Um, you know, it would display what we are, you know, uh, whatever signal we're se receiving or sending could be 720, could be 10 1080, um, could be 1080. Um, you could change your, uh, the rate to be, you know, 5994. Uh, Kim Ree could correct me on this if I'm wrong, but I think 2997. Um, and I can't remember what the other one is. Um, but um, we, str we just use it for our embed and disembed. It's also, as Joe was pointing out, you know, you get all these embedders and disembedders in a fly pack, um, very small uh, piece of gear. Well, you know, relatively small for what it is. Um, and you're having like all these cables running a bunch of different directions. Um, you know, you have like, you know, we'd either have to put them in a frame, like a like three or four RU frame, or we'd have to put, you know, like Velcro to like the side of the fly pack or whatever. So or the inside of the fly pack. So this gives us a one RU unit that is able to, again, embed and disembed audio um, very easily. Uh, yeah, quick that... question, quick, quick question from the chat. And by the chat, I mean, from my brain, uh, what is, uh, and or who is Maddie? Uh, Cause we didn't really talk about that. <laughs> oh. Well, we know um, we fired Dante. Well, we did fire Dante. Yeah, so, Dante, he was a um, terrible employee. So we fired Dante, hired Maddie. Um, <laughs> but so great, great just swap. for anybody out there who doesn't know, um, Maddie, uh, you can do, um, I believe it's, and again, I could be, uh, you correct, somebody correct me if I'm wrong, but it's 64 channels of audio at 48K, um, which again, this device is technically 64 channels. Um, down that input or output, um, but it's really an SDI line. The Maddie out is actually sending uh, 32 channels to front of house, and then the Maddie in is receiving 32 channels from front of house. Um, now, obviously, we are not embedding 32 channels of audio. We're really just using it for our left, right, or our house mix to get to uh, back to Kimry for uh, you know we send a return feed, um, and so that's kind of how we use it is uh maddie maddie is just audio it's audio going over sdi line um digital audio going over an sdi line to front of house um instead of having a bunch of analog you know xlr connections this is just an easier solution and hey. what does what does maddie stand for again yeah i put you on the spot justin what does maddie stand for yep multi-channel Go ahead. Multi-channel audio, uh, something interface. Digital. Uh, digital. 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 Thank you, Justin Bayshore. Why didn't you answer that then? You should have just spoke up and said it if you knew it. No, it was, it was <clears> testing <throat> you. That was all. It gets you a little bit with the high yeah. first multi-channel word, but um, another, hey. another advantage. Well, here's the thing. I also didn't think we were going to go into that, so I didn't you know, put it in my brain before we started this. You should be prepared. You should be ready for anything. You're right. I should be prepared for anything, Plug. especially with how fast we move. Let's yeah. be honest. Anybody walking around saying, hey, can you run me a multi-channel audio digital interface line? <laughs> Very long. <laughs> uh, probably not. But anyway. Uh, hey, thing. Joe. Yeah. Quick plug in. If uh, if Tanner Dietz is watching right now, we need his fly pack so we can put this in it. Yeah. Ooh, nice. Yes. Ooh, Tanner that's a good, good plug. Out. That's right. Spoiler plug, yeah. Nate. Yes. Um, but anyway, yeah. Yeah. 
Another advantage to this FS4 device is it's networkable, so you can do all your configuration uh, just through the web uh, web browser uh, once you set an IP for it. So that makes it really quick to, to jump in, to get a status update, to do configurations, run software updates, that kind of stuff. Um, you know, redundant power supplies. And also, the those other embedder and disembedders um, tend to have a little higher noise floor when you're converting to analog audio. So this keeps everything digital, which helps keep the audio a little cleaner. So several reasons why I price point, it's significantly higher than the Cobalt or the AJA stuff, um, but you are getting what you pay for. So kind of like what I said earlier, uh, like cost and quality tend to, to, you know, follow one another. So, but hey, Camry, you can show us some cool stuff. I'm going to hop out of uh, my presentation here. Yeah, one thing we also should probably say is we're using the FS4, FS2, whatever for like our specific use. And it does so much more than that. It's a frame sync, it cross converts, uh, it embeds, it de-embeds, like all of that. Um, that's just our particular application. So it's really, it's really nice. You could have four inputs of whatever, um, and then you could have them all be converted to 1080i if that's what your system is. Um, so yeah, that's like, that's our that's our use for it, but it's really a, it's a frame sync, and I think we're going to go into that another day. Um, yeah, for sure. But uh, um, it, it's super helpful. Zach, before you dive into to Valentine stuff, I just want to recap real quick uh, with Justin. So we're using uh, the FS4. We're using two the first two channels to embed audio to Correct. video, yep. and then sending those. Mm -hmm. So our first input on the FS4 is taking just the switch feed from our campuses or from a, a camera from our campuses, yep. embedding that Correct. with two channels off of the front of house console. And then that is being streamed mm -hmm. to Ballantyne yes. for capture and for so, preview and stuff like that. Yeah, so hitting our uh, encoder that is currently on site, which we have in Makito, but it's our encoder that's on site that is sending to Ballantyne. Um, and then, yeah, to follow up with that, the second, in um in better would be for it's just it's the same feed so it's the exact same house left right mm -hmm. um but it's actually so that we can uh send um that to game capture so the first two channels so it would be 17 18 of the second sdi line would be um the audio that is going to our game capture or whatever our recording device is um and then what we've also done is we've started to uh, send other channels. So we'll do like a, uh, like a, an aux that has just worship leaders or, uh, announce mics or whatever, basically a talking head kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, so that, you know, one thing that people struggle with is worship is loud and great and you can hear it and it's full. And then when somebody goes to a talking head, they can't hear them because the band's playing too loud or our people are like, our production team is sitting side stage and they can't hear. So this gives us another opportunity to be at, for production to hear the announce, uh, whoever's announcing or, you know, whoever's the campus pastor or whoever is doing the welcome that weekend, they're able to hear them a lot clearer because um, they can just turn up that other, you know, input that's going into some speakers or into com for us uh, at our camp at our other campuses. Gotcha. So going back to last week a little bit, so we've got embed one, and mm -hmm. in your video routing, if you remember from last week, we talked about video routing. If you go in, you'll see embed one is gonna be routed to uh, whatever encoder, video encoder we're sending to Valentine. Correct. But then you'll also see embed two routed to a few different places. And that's pretty Correct. much anywhere that we want audio along with video. So things like overflow mm -hmm. feed, if we're having that all go down the same SDI line, um, we'll send embed two. So if you're ever trying to get audio and video somewhere, and you just route a video signal to it, that's not gonna work. You have to actually route the embedded signal. You have to route the video signal right. that you want to that embedder, and then you have to route mm -hmm. the embedder to whatever destination you want video and audio. So embed one, embed two, and then the channels three and four on the FS4, those we're using those as disembedders. And just to recap, Correct. the first one, we would call it de-embed one, that's really input three on the FS4. Uh, Correct. that is our, uh, living as one decode yep. device. So that's what's basically doing church. And that's taking eight channels of audio and then sending that mm -hmm. to the front of house console. Correct. 
and then we're independently sending living as one to the switcher. Yep. And then the fourth channel on the FS4 is our other video playback device. And we're just using yeah. the first four channels on that. And we're not using Correct. LA channels. Yeah, um, so they're all, they're, we just have them always routed so that if we ever file on the T2 that was eight channels, the Grass Valley T2, um, plug. Um, if sponsor. we had, not sponsor. Um, but if but if we had eight channels or we had a playback that was eight channels, um, then we could they you know they would just need to you know, adjust that or assign those channels on the SD9. But it's always going to front of house and it's always patched. It just needs to be you know put on a channel input. Yeah. So. And then the benefit of, of doing that all through the router, again, pointing back to last week, the benefit of having this all go through the router is that if we ever want to disembed another source, so say instead of playing videos from our Grass Valley T2, we want to play videos from one of our computers, we can just route one of our computers to that disembedder, and Correct. now audio is hitting the same place on the front of house desk as that T2 was, because it's all going yep. through the video router and all that. We have that flexibility. Um, so we're using two two embedders, two disembedders at our campuses for those different purposes. Uh, Zach, you want to blow our minds with uh, what you're doing at Valentine for a second? Sure, I can do that. <laughs> Try to at so least. Humble. Way to way to set me up. Sound like a total tool. It's fine. <laughs> Always. <laughs> it wouldn't be Tech Tuesday if you didn't uh, blow our we minds. We didn't hop into the Valentine router Absolutely. for a second. Yeah. So uh, here at Valentine, this is our main, this is what I call my embed one. And this is going out to, um, this is going out to all of the locations uh, using living as one. But I tried to draw it out here because this is what it takes to get that audio embedded into the video signal to go out to the other locations. Uh, so we'll just start with the, um, with the audio consoles. So we've got our SD, 10 is at front of house and it's sitting on the OptiCore ring, which is what I've drawn here. And then we have the PG2, which is a converter that's taking the OptiCore to MADI uh, to and from. It's a two way device. Uh, so we can take MADI to it or MADI from it. So we've got the SD10 and we've got it spitting out uh, to the MADI ports on this device. And then from the PG2, we're actually hitting our MADI router here. So here we've got a separate MADI router, whereas at all of our not our, at all of our other locations we're not doing any MADI routing. It's a, it's truly a direct link between the FS4 and the SD9 in front of house. Well, here there's a lot of MADI, uh, so we've got a 16 by 16 MADI router sitting in the equipment room, and then so I'm taking MADI from the PG2 into the MADI router, and then the MADI router and Everts. So the Everts MADI router and the Everts video router are made to be tied together. So I have uh, one cable going, or I have two cables. They both they go both ways. Um, I'm sorry, they don't go both ways. I've got a uh, in and an out going between the video router and the uh, MADI router. Mm -hmm. And so that's allowing us to link anything here with anything on the audio ring. And that is one of these links will handle eight MADI streams. So we've actually got two of these links going between uh, the two audio router, between the audio router and the video router. And it's actually, they're dedicated input and output cards on the router as well. So it's not actually like a port on the router. These are specific cards to embed and de-embed audio. Um, so from there, we're taking, we're routing that signal over here to the video router and it is coming in to one of the embedding output cards on the video router. And so that embedding output card for embed one, which I've listed here is output 91. So output 91 through 98 are routable. And what I mean by that is I literally have that embedding output coming out and right back into the router via a short jumper cable. That way we can route it wherever we want to in the building. We can do whatever we want to with it. Um, so it just allows us to be flexible. It also allows us to monitor it um, via multi-viewer. So I've got a multi-viewer that's got eight windows on it that is monitoring embed one through eight. So <clears throat> that being said, backing up just a little bit, 
the embedding output is taking has the acuity program routed to it to to that embedding output on the router and then it's bearing or it's marrying the audio to it and so this signal right here coming back in on input 109 is embed one and that has the acuity me one program f on it and the eight channels of audio that we are sending to our other locations and so then once we have that coming back in on input 109 i'm routing it out output 72 straight to the living as one encoder so real quick, uh, why are you, and I'm, I actually didn't even know this. Uh, can you explain, cause you lost me a little bit. Can you explain again why you're doing the loop out from like in, output 91 to input 109? That's so I can route it wherever because that output is coming off the router and that is where the embedding is happening into the SDI signal. So we have to be able to either send it somewhere directly or we want to be able to route it somewhere so like embed one for instance it's going to uh the t2 that's in there as a backup capture it's going to uh, a hyperdeck for a capture file it's going to a softron channel for a capture file and then it's going to the encoder so, so if we had it you, why wouldn't you just route uh 91 output 91 to those devices that's what i'm getting that's what i'm missing I'm sorry, I, I am, but I have to get it back into the router to then take that one source and distribute it to the other destinations. Okay, gotcha. So essentially it's just well, I think, being able to route that to multiple places. Yeah, because what you're saying, Zach, is output 91 is just a single line and you can only send that once it's embedded to one place. Unless Correct. You if, if you want to think of it this way, right. think about output 91 being the output of the fs4 with embed okay. one on it yep, if you I want to look it. at it that way that, yep. so then i'm having to put it back into the router so i can distribute it out yeah that adds the complexity because you're doing the embedding and the routing are you doing the embedding within the router correct so that makes a ton of sense yeah that, that makes a lot of sense and so then right here you see embed one through eight we can all route and then output 99 through 106 are all hard routes to certain sources uh, or I mean, to certain destinations. Um, there are several, three of them, or sorry, five of them are currently spares that we can do whatever with. And so those ones come into master control. If we're testing something, uh, I can set it up in here and just pop it, pop one of those lines to it and route whatever video and whatever audio from anywhere uh, I want to. Got it. Nice. Cool. Thanks, Zach. Okay, uh, questions uh, mind about any of this? Congratulations. Sorry, go ahead, Joe. The mind officially blown. Well done, Zach. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that, that really messes with your brain. I'll tell you what, <clears throat> that's impressive. Yeah, there's a little bit going on at Valentine. I guess that makes sense. I don't know why we can't just use black magic. Just so one out. of the things <clears throat> that we're just we were talking about like video and everything that I think it's worth mentioning is um, SDI is you can't just go down any cable. So if you're like in an older building and you have like coax or whatever, uh, it might not be able to, to handle, you know, if you're at like 1080p, 60 frame or 59.94 or 50 for, uh, frames per second, um, those cables might not be able to handle that sort of bit rate. Um, so make sure when you're uh, buying SDI cable or if you're making your own or you're putting together, you know, a system like this, make, make sure you're, uh, you know, paying attention to the cables that you're buying. So uh, RG6 um, is, is kind of the most common that that'll go uh, like about 300 feet. Um, and then you have uh, RG59, which uh, is recommended not to go much past a hundred foot. I don't know. I read that on a website. Um, and I, I can, I can probably oh, think so it's much, it must be true for sure. It must be true. Yeah. Uh, so I found a couple of really great websites about like, what is SDI and there's a one about choosing the right sort of video cable. We could probably, I could probably send those links and we can maybe post it in the video, but you can just go ahead and post it on the chat if you want. Um, yeah, I could, I could do that. Um, 
maybe I'll do it, do it after I'm done talking. But um, anyway, they, they no, talk about right like this. We'll watch. It's empty. <laughs> Try to do both at the same time. <laughs> oh, I'm terrible at multitasking. Um, <clears throat> so, um, you know, if you're wanting to do like HD um, and, and even just kind of knowing the SMPTE standards, because that will also determine, um, you know, what sort of converters you get, because not all converters will do, if you're wanting to do 4K, which seem, everyone seems to be wanting to do, not all converters can handle that and not all cables can handle that. Um, and even HDMI cable. So it's just worth mentioning, you know, making sure, uh, and usually it's on the jacket of the cable um, of what sort of, and it's 75 ohm, that matters. Um, and just making sure you're paying attention to, you know, the cables and the connectors and, and converters um, and that the system you're trying to build, that those cables support that. And you need consistency. <clears throat> For sure. What you're talking Absolutely. about. Absolutely. What you're talking about with 4k is like just because you have a 4k tv doesn't mean you're actually watching it in 4k your source has right. to be because if it's a 1080 source your pixels are just getting duplicated you're not actually adding unique content um, right right yeah that's you, important you know, what you were saying about the the signal length and let you certainly like we can have runs like signal get from one place to another that's further than 300 feet you just need something to reclock it like a router yep. some of those those mini converters and things will you know, boost the signal, reclock it, give you another, you know, 300 feet of it, but you just have to make sure that that's in fact what it's able to do. Well, I think yeah, that routers and FS4 and that kind of stuff can reclock the signal so you get that extra length. But yeah, that's a great point. Yeah. Yeah. Re reclocking the thing. Boost it and reclock it. Uh, okay. Marco had a question. I think Joe, you kind of referenced this, um, uh, wanted to bring it up for everybody watching. Uh, what if you have an SDI signal with eight correct audio streams in it? Uh, for example, recording ISO, and then you want to record another ISO with the same audio embedded, but not the same video. So different video source, but same audio. Do you still need, would, would you need to add a second embedder? Yeah. Anytime you have the content being varied in some way, even if it's one channel of audio is different. You're going to need a whole new embedder because essentially your embedder is only going to do, you know, one group of content, a video signal, and then whatever audio signal you're sending it. So if you want to change anything about that signal, once it's leaving the embedder, you have to, you know, introduce a second embedder. Now in this situation, if you're just doing it for either redundant audio capture or something like that, you know, great. But if you really don't need to, then you just can record that additional video signal without audio. Um, you know, as long as your system is all getting the right, the same amount of reference and things are synced up and everything to make your post process easier. Now, I believe Zach, that's one of the advantages that you guys have, uh, or I should say we, it's not you guys, we're all on the same team. Um, but at Valentine with the router being the embedder as well, you could have the same audio, uh, audio sources, but a different video source and just route that to another recording channel. Is that correct? Yeah. As long as that recording channel has its own embedding output, we could totally do that. Yeah. yeah. So you technically would in another embedder. You just have more flexibility with the system that's set up like a Valentine. Um, yep. We are, we are using OBS. Thanks for jumping in there, Chris, uh, just to stream this right now on YouTube. Um, and so this is just a desktop capture on this window and streaming to YouTube through OBS. Um, Jeff, I don't know if we can answer this. It's a little, uh, he says a little off topic. Do you know what distributor you use to get music videos up to iTunes? Uh, loving Graves into Gardens, by the way. Thank you so much. We're loving it too, jamming out. Um, that all goes through. So uh, I know we're uh, an independent music label, Elevation Worship. But I believe we uh, use um, Sony for distribution and i know that because they're the ones that give us all the copyright claims on our videos um but <laughs> i'm not 100 percent sure on that that would not be our area of expertise but i do know we use a distributor um to help get music out to and, and content out to uh youtube but anybody else know anything about that no i think we need to get our uh, our resident expert alex duncan on one of these these calls yeah, he might be good. I'll just get a Duncan at elevationchurch.org. You can shoot him an email. He'd probably know better. I'll just give his email out. I don't care. Throw him under the bus. 
Um, well, actually, uh, Jeff, ask that. Jeff, throw your email in the chat. We'll get an answer and we'll shoot you an email. Perfect. Thanks, Joe. Um, let's see. Oh, Suede, is that how you say it? Suede uh, asks, what are y'all using for host mic embedding? Zach, that's actually a great question. So how are you embedding host mics uh, for Elevation Online? Uh, as far as how to, yeah, I'm not following that camera, I guess. I'm sorry, I'm not following that question. Are we yeah, asking if how we're doing it at the camera or how are we yeah. getting it to the, how we're doing it at the camera? Yeah, yeah. Well, we're doing uh, it at the camera, right? Yes, yeah, so we are doing it at the camera for, 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 for the, the main wired mics. camera. Yeah, depending yeah, on what for it the is. wired mics. It's just, uh, oh, that reminds me, we need to set, I need to set the audio settings back from what me and you did yesterday. Oh, yeah, thanks. Reminder. Um, so <laughs> we are taking, we're using the, we are using the camera to embed the signal. So most cameras have XLR inputs and you can plug a mic right into it and it will automatically embed it. Yeah. I have not found a camera that has it has mic inputs and SDI out that is not just automatically embedding that audio into it. Yep. I've got one right here actually. It's got two XLR inputs. So same basic concept. Um, but then you guys are disembedding that at the consoles to get those host mics into the audio consoles. And that's all happening through yeah, the eBridge correct. router. Correct. Got it. And so not to jump on that trail, but I have de-embedding cards in my router. So that camera is actually wired to a de-embedding card. And then I get in my router uh, a source of the video of that input. And I get 16 audio sources of that input as well. And so then I'm taking that audio source and through the Maddie router, getting it to the Maddie stream going to the SD11. And then that is being patched on the 11. Man, Maddie is so good at her job. AC Leffler, can you explain embedding translation to streams? Uh, I believe we're translating. Um, we actually aren't doing live translation right now. Uh, but if we were, Zach, how would you approach uh, doing a translation, like a live translation? Ooh. Yeah, that's going to put me on the spot. Yeah. I can tell you how uh, we were at Matthews back in the day. So. Yeah, yeah, I think I don't remember. I think it was Ricky posted on his Instagram last week about how they're doing it at Hillsong. And it was honestly, it blew my mind. Um, how are they doing it? No, 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 no. I'm sorry. It wasn't Ricky. It was Sam at Life Church. So they were yeah. taking uh, Pastor Craig's mic and putting it into a bus and they were doing a Zoom call to the translators and so they're sending pastor craig's mm. mic to the zoom call and then coming back and the zoom and the translation translators audio when it triggered it would actually duck pastor craig's audio and they were wow. going for a 90 10 i think is what sam's instagram said so 90 percent translation with 10 percent of pastor craig being under it and honestly i was like dang like it blew my mind I'm like that's a really freaking awesome idea if you need to like because I think it was for the global leadership thing. And so it was just a one-off thing they needed to figure out. So I don't know yeah. much past that, but. Um, That's really cool. Yeah. Yeah. Life.church tech. Um, you can check them out on YouTube. They've been doing Zoom calls every Thursday about different topics similar to this. Um, but check them out too. They've been putting on a ton of conversation. They're great friends of ours. Um, we love them and they know a lot more than us. So. <laughs> um, so, but Joe, what were we doing? Because we were doing translation, and I don't want it, people to think that you have to have all this huge infrastructure to do that kind of stuff. Because we were doing it at one point. What? How were we doing it in the past? Yeah, and actually, it it utilized the embedding stuff that we're talking about. So, at our our Matthews campus, we um, we just got some Listen Technologies gear from Sweetwater. Um, it's basically just a, a little antenna that takes um, an XLR input, and then you can buy the the wireless packs. Kind of like a like mini IMs essentially, and we would just put the antenna in the back, and then um, hand out packs to people as they came in uh, with earbuds, and then we set up a little kind of translation studio, which basically at some at one point was just in a room, and we put the we had the embedded feed 
going into that room, going through the TV, and then the person doing the translation had a mic that then was routed, just connected through XLR to that antenna. And then they had headphones on and they were listening to the worship experience audio from the from the auditorium. And then they were live translating in the moment just into that mic, which was then going through the antenna, hitting the people's packs that were inside. So um, <clears throat> they would listen to worship just uh, normally in the room. And then once the sermon started, they put on their ears. And so then they would just they would hear somebody translating the voice and that the way that we did it that way just kept everything in real time so that what they were hearing being translated was was just a you know a few seconds at most behind what they were live hearing in the room so um not not overly expensive not terribly difficult to set up uh but it definitely was impactful we saw a lot of people reach through that which was pretty cool That's awesome uh jeff he was asking, can you embed broadcast mix uh, left, right on channels one and two and then other ISO audio channels on three through eight and use that same encoded feed to both campuses and to online broadcast? I guess we could. There's no reason we couldn't if we were okay with that channels one and two to our campuses being the house mix or the broadcast mix rather. Um, why don't we do that, Justin? Um you're talking about specifically like sending like uh, front of house one and two. Yeah. Yeah. So our eight channels that we use, um, we have it split out. So uh, the first two is like a left, right, which is usually um, we'll put loop down that uh, sometimes keys, sometimes it, uh, you know, we'll do, I think acoustic down that. Um, things that are coming from Ballantyne that are kind of important that another campus may not have. Cause sometimes we have campuses that don't have an acoustic, you know, yeah. that weekend and they need that. So the one and two are specifically for, you know, elements and stuff like that. Three is for click and MD four is for our worship leader or whoever is singing uh, a song that we are, you know, sending out. So our whole experience is always be, uh, is always being sent. So we're always sending the same eight channels from, you know, the start of the experience all the way until the end. Um, and so if a worship leader is leading one song at Valentine, but you don't need it for that, you would still hear them down that channel four. Um, cause that's just how we switch it with through automation. Um, and then five is time code. Um, six, six and seven is, uh, AR, which we also, uh, during our, uh, uplink song, um, which is our song where our, all of our church, like all of our campuses come together. Um, and it's being led from Valentine, we put choir down that. So any weekend that we have choir, we actually send, uh, it's six mics is what we have. So it's three stereo pair of uh, choir mics that are actually going down on the AR channel. And then when pastor gets on stage, we mute the AR, uh, or we mute the choir mics and AR is being sent. So uh, again, that's through for... automation as well. Uh, um, audience response. Great. You gotta work. Make sure we uh, stay on top of your acronyms, Justin. Hey, Kim. Good. I I, I kind of wonder, if, Jeff, clarify for us if you can in the chat. I'm curious if this question is asking, can you can you send the same encoded feed to two sources? And if you're sending channel, like, essentially you're putting your house left, right on one and two. If you encode all eight channels with other content to the encoder and then broadcast it to the web, is are all eight channels going to get summed into the feed, or is it just going to give you one and two? You're muted. <laughs> Couldn't find my mouse to don't unmute myself. Mute, don't mute shame him. Um, I don't know what they would do, to be honest with you. Our high vision encoders would not. They only look at channel one and two. Um, but I don't know about other encoders, uh, what they would do with that. Um, hmm, yeah, that's a great question. I, I'm not sure. Yeah, that's something to consider. I know another reason. Because there are a lot of devices that will sum and that, that will get you in a mess of trouble very yep. quickly and if you you need to know your gear or you'll learn the hard way like like i did with uh the ross converters that we were talking about last week they will sum all 16 channels of audio and so if you have the click going to your primary online embedder and uh and it gets routed to the green room you get click in the green room very loudly so fun learn that the hard way the ross <laughs> converters we talked about will sum all 16 channels of audio and uh They'll spit it right out that HDMI. 
And I know another another thing that we do is we have separate consoles, which is a luxury for sure, but separate consoles for online versus the auditorium, just recognizing the vastly different scenario that people are listening and, rec and needing a new an individual mix for both of those circumstances. So having two things separated like that and being able to encode and embed uniquely for each output, so to speak, and each audience um, is kind of where we've landed. Um, last question we got in here, Jeremy, when you route uh, multi viewers to master control or anywhere in the building, is it just an SDI cable from the equipment room for each or is there something more advanced to getting a bunch of video from equipment room to master control? You wanna walk through your multi viewer workflow real quick, big picture? Yeah, I, I wish there was an easy way, but uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, my six TVs in here, they all have their six SDIs coming right off the router uh, going under the floor. So, you know, no big bulk uh, multi-cable coming down here. It's just, it's six individual SDI runs come down here uh, to make, make that happen. No smoke and mirrors there. Yeah. But then the actual multi-viewer brains are in the equipment room and those are getting individual outputs off the router so we can route individual things to each window. Correct. Yeah, correct. They are, they have all their feeds in there. Um, it's actually going from the router to a frame with the multi-viewer cards in it and via what Everts calls their X-Link cable. And it'll, it carries 32 channels of video and audio embedded in those video channels over to the cards. And then it just gives me an SDI out on the back of it. Yeah, right on. Um, there was one other question that, how important is SDI reference between devices? Justin, oh, Zach, yeah. you guys can speak to that. Gotta have reference, always. Um, it'll you'll it'll be a nightmare and if you can give it reference locally uh, if it's got a local uh, reference input on it try and absolutely use that that way you keep your latency down as much as possible because adding a frame sync in say a carbonite or something that'll add you a frame of delay right there uh, so if, if it's got the option always do it uh, and if it doesn't then yeah just use a use a frame sync to run it through uh, let us know in the chat if uh, you want us to do a tech Tuesday on frame sync and reference and all that fun stuff. Some I think we might do. Uh, that's definitely a topic that a lot of people overlook but can definitely get you if you don't know what you're doing. So uh, yeah, well, thanks uh, Jeremy, Jeff, uh, Kyle, some of, our, some of our veterans, some of the guys I watch every week. Thank you guys for tuning in, watching um, today. Joey, uh, appreciate y'all being with us. Um, would love to see you guys next Tuesday. Uh, what are we talking about next Tuesday? We haven't decided yet, I don't think. We had a few ideas <laughs> floating around. Word on the street is that we've been talking about a lot of video lately. I think I think those audio guys are itching for some content. Yeah, audio guys, are you in the chat? Are you there? Are you watching? Let us know if you want to see some uh, some audio content next week. Maybe even have a uh, maybe have a guest, an honorary tech team member. Uh, jump on and hang out. So, anyway, uh, anybody got any closing thoughts, parting words for this Tuesday? Justin, what does Maddie stand for? Wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. Basial. No. Wasn't it? No, yeah, wasn't it? I I proved I knew what it was. I had to give Wisnet you the answer. Multi-channel audio I mean, digital interface. Multi-channel audio said digital it. interface. What does Dante You're stand for? You're the integrator, not me. Uh, ask our level two, uh, our level two Dante certified. Doesn't, I don't think Dante stands for anything. I think it's automates the company, and I think it's just a play on on their word or uh, their. You can explain about Dante. Digital digital audio not transmitting. Excellent. Ever. <laughs> I definitely said not transmitting ever. <laughs> Digital audio, Don, not transmitting. Yes. Oh, Jeremy, just man. That was good. <laughs> uh, it was there. I just Dante, had to work through it. Dante was definitely a case of early adopter syndrome for us. We got on a little too early on the train and had a bad experience with it. But it's whatever. Yeah. You know, it's great. Uh, you all, people use it all the time. I'm sure it's helpful. Yeah, it's, it's, they, have, they have really great training. Um, I, I was training, at least, you know. The, yeah, level two. Didn't do level three. But... Uh, I, I use Dante pretty heavy at my old church, um, just to, like a little sound check. It's honestly like it's stable. Maddie is just more universal 
and it's used quite a bit. Um, Dante really kind of fall, goes in the black magic category for us. It works pretty yeah, good. Yeah, we just <clears throat> use something else. So yeah, it's I mean it's just a it's just another tool. I mean it's it's stabilized and they've done a really good job of building up that that uh, protocol. So I, I really have nothing bad to say about Dante, other than it's a little about you know some of like the unicast and uh just how you can do some things but that's all in the training and they talk about it whereas maddie just seems to work Period. speaking of uh dante last question matt would you rather name your kids after digital audio um protocols or oh uh rigging techniques oh man um probably rigging techniques i learned rock and roll is a term from kimry so rock and roll himaly yeah, that'd be awesome. Would you rather name? Your yeah. Kids, would you rather name your kids after a manu lighting manufacturer or the fixture name? The fixture name? Yeah. Electrolyte. Like, hey, Chauvet, come oh, here. Right. Or, hey, <laughs> well, okay. Chauvet, there's people named Chauvet. Yeah. Uh, not too far. <laughs> like, yeah, Electrolyte, Hemily. Ooh, man. <laughs> or uh, Viper, Hemily. Or Ooh, uh, I like that. Pro Proteus, Rogue. Pro Protus, Rogue, Rogue, Emily. Rogue, yeah, Rogue Maverick. Emily. Oh man, <laughs> Maverick, Emily. <laughs> all right, Matt's getting some. We probably better stop before Claire gets too mad. <laughs> Claire's gonna be yeah, she's up. probably listening she's to this, like, oh dear lord. <laughs> okay. Anyway, uh, thank you guys for joining us. We're gonna uh, jump off here before this degrades into too much madness. Anyway, uh, we'll see you guys next Tuesday. Bye.